pizza time. Oh boy, have we got a complicated one today. So much that we have some guests here. First is a familiar face who's been proofreading my script since the first episode of Stargazer. Well, I don't think my face is familiar because you don't see it. Hi! We also have a newcomer, a friend of mine, and somebody who's familiar with peace. Lagardo. Oh, uh, hey guys, I'm just here for the food. So we are reviewing Zoophobia. Not just the characters, but the comic as a whole. It was made back in 2012 or so by Vivian Nerdbrock, to butcher that name, and was discontinued around 2016 or so. Who also happens to be the creator of Hasman Hotel! Pizza time. What the? Why'd that happen? Also, we have a counter for how many times we bring up Hasman Hotel. Pizza time. Every time. Hasman! 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 Oh. All right, then, before we get to the characters, let's just talk about some general issues with the comic. Keep in mind, this is coming from somebody who not only likes the premise of Zootopia, but also has made a far more disastrous webcomic. Really? When was that? Late middle school and early high school. But enough about that. Let's move on to the general visual hiccups. Like the lack of linear perspective in earlier chapters, which is best showcased by this page right here. Yeah, you gonna bring up why the rooms don't look like school rooms? As in the lack of people in them, the lack of props, or the weird color choices for them. Uh, all of that and then some. Seriously, what kind of art room is red and black? And what's up with the music room? Again, the later chapters do resolve the population perspective problem that the scene decoration could use work of. Uh, what about the, the weird faces? I don't like it. I mean, some of them are a bit funky, but I don't think they're that bad. But they're all weird! There isn't a normal looking one of them all! I think I get what you're saying, but for me, it's not the faces. It's rather the limbs. Livesy draws the characters like they're extremes rather than key posts. Well, drawing them this way may work for more energetic scenes. It should be more of an exception than the rule. Solid forms are more important in comics since it is a static medium that uses posing, speed lines, and sequential panels to convey motion. Strange that the arms actually aren't like that in Happen Hotel. Pizza time. I wanted that line. You stole it from me! It's news you lose. Well, that should do it for general issues, right? Perspectives, background. Oh! Please refrain from using the Magic Circle's Yimba brushes. They're too recognizable and complex for the comics cartoony style. It would be simpler to draw your own magical effects in the vector program like Illustrator, and then apply some simple blur or glow filters to your preferred drawing program. It's not that big an issue, but it does get distracting, especially on that page. Uh, which page? Uh, I think I know which one he's talking about. Regardless, I believe we've kept our audience waiting. Let's get into the characters and story, starting with the weakest link and our protagonist, Camera. No, no, that can't be. That's the protagonist? Oh. Wait, wait, wait. I thought the demon kid was the protagonist. Damien, right? No, nope, he's not really the protagonist. Firstly, let's quickly go over Cameron's visual design before we actually cover the major issues she has. All right, guys, tell me what the first thing that came to your mind when you saw Cameron. Dull. Boring. Yeah, visually, there isn't much to Cameron. However, that's understandable given that she's supposed to play off the colorful cast of characters and be something of a stand-in for the audience. Yeah, <laughs> supposed to. Mmm, that's where we get into the elephant in the room. Cameron doesn't fill that purpose very well. It's mainly due to her major character flaw. Say it with me, folks. Zoophobia. While it's good for a character to have flaws, Cameron's zoophobia is supremely crippling for her to act as the protagonist, especially during Chapter 2. 
which starts with her, but then shifts to other characters. It makes her character nearly static for the whole chapter. The audience barely gets any information because nobody is there to ask questions. It's sad, because she has hints of positive character traits, like when she finally decides to do her job and give Jack some counseling. Uh, she's a counselor? Yes. For the school? Yes, of animals, which she is afraid of. <laughs> Before we close the book on Cameron and show her scorecard, yes, we're doing scorecards now, I really want to say how she could have improved, because if anything, she's a very disappointing character. First, make her observant or at least curious. That way she can ask questions and solve them with the reader. Next is her desire to help others. While it's there in the comic, it needs to win out over her fear in order for her to have that arc. As this review continues, I'll occasionally expand upon this idea. For now, we leave Cameron with her final rating. Did it wait. One of the original five that were made years before the comic. Let's uh, talk about Zill. Okay, what is this guy? Uh, Mira, if you would. Chimera. Well, there you have it. Though, to be fair, not even the cast know what he is. Though, I think we wouldn't be that confused if he kept his tail out. Seriously, how does he retract that and his wings? As far as color, it needs some work. The purple clashes too hard with the orange. Her? Either make it bluish or have a bluish purple. As is, it's a little too garish for me. As for his character, initially he comes off as having an arrogant streak. Though he does have some redeeming qualities like being protective of his friends. Those being Jack and his uh, girlfriend, Kayla. On the other hand, what kind of boyfriend forgets their anniversary? Uh, the foolish kind? Yeah, probably. I've got two situations where Cameron can help his ill. Either through Kayla taking him into counseling for their relationship, or having him find out about Damien shoving Jack into a locker. This would escalate into a scuffle between two, getting both into trouble would send them to Cameron's room for some help, and we could actually learn a bit more about the two. Cool. Like we mentioned before, Kayla is Zild's girlfriend. Design-wise, she's all right. She's kind of a brown dog. Kangaroo. Uh, what? Don't believe me? Check the wiki. Mira! The reptile is correct. I'll be. Well, in the comic, it was hard to tell. Maybe you revised its snout to resemble a kangaroo. They tend to have rounded noses. Before we delve into our character, can we talk about this line where she finds out Zil forgot their anniversary? And it is, and I quote, This upsets me. That's it? That's all she's got to say? Uh, it's not that bad. It's that bad. It's that bad. Setting that weird line aside, Kayla is otherwise an okay character. She has her interests like singing, fencing, but aside from her relationship with Zill, we don't get that much of her outside of that. This is mainly due to, of course, lack of interaction between her and Cameron, or any other character for that. Uh, again, I covered how she could get involved with Cameron's arc. I mean, her relationship with Zill just mends itself without any involvement with Cameron or anyone else. It just kind of fixes itself. Cool. Now, some of you may know this character from Vivian's third year SVA film, The Son of 666. You mean the real protagonist? I mean, he didn't make the most of the comic. Oh, I read. Well, I suppose you want to take this one, then. Oh, my body is ready. Let's give this thing a go. He's got a Shadow the Hedgehog look going with for him, with the red and black. I'd also make him look more dangerous. Maybe give him a more punk little boots. I don't know if he gets better later on, but I remember him being nasty to Zill and Jack. Especially when he stuffed Jack into a locker. Of course, that was due to a love triangle between Zill, Kayla, and Damien. For any who need clarification, simply refer to the Zoophobia relationship chart. How many characters did she make for this comic? More. Uh. So, where does Damien sit in the theoretical revision? Well, he is Cameron's final trial. After dealing with several other students like Jack, Addison, and maybe Zill, she manages to mitigate her crippling fear in order to actually do her job for more than one chapter. What I would have her do is 
find out a bit about his family, maybe help him get over Kayla and resolve that little mess. But most of all, at the end of the chapter in question, she should be the one to encourage him to talk to his father about attending school in the mortal realm. Unless you want to really go crazy and have her see Damien's redeeming qualities and muster the courage to confront his father to let him stay on Earth. How would that be for character development? I mean, it was frustrating to have Damien's arc happen without him so much as having any quality time with the school counselor. Brutal. Next is Jack. This guy's quite easy. He's a scruffy looking dog with some hints of green and brown. This is mainly because the guy is cursed with immortality. You see, his mother made a pact with the devils to make him unkillable. However, there's always a catch. That being, he has the worst luck ever. And his best friend is Zip. Oh my various gods. Hmm, he's like Balder, but still feels pain. That said, he's a good character who manages to get by despite his issues. Not to mention the fact that he actually goes to Cameron for counseling. Brutal. Next on the list is Spam. Wait, who's this? You don't remember Spam? Otherwise known as Samuel Oden. Who? Never heard of her. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, he just shows up to lick people from time to time. Main five, everyone! Crazy. Next up is uh, next up. All right, another of the main five. Freaking Kingdom Hearts name at that. Something's all about her face. Looks too detached from her head. Someone finally gets it. There's a there's a weird cheated angle with her face. I don't mind it as much. Overall, she's just middle of the road. You don't really get much from her. But she's not a major detriment to the story, so there's that. Bravo. Now for Mackenzie. Is she a porcupine? No, human. What? However, the thing is, she wants to be a cat's person. Because she was raised by one. At least that's what the wiki says. I really like her cat hood she puts on to try to fit in. A strange thing is that most of this information is conveyed through only a few pages. Yet she left a very strong impression. Which is more than I can say for other characters. So she's a furry. Yes, in a world of furries. Incredible. Hmm. The worst part is she's ostracized for it. <laughs> ah. All right. Addison. Visually, Addison is very good. Loving the analogous greens and yellows. As for a species, I'd like our guest here to figure it out. Um, Arctic Fox? Close, Fennec Fox. Oh, like Pit from Paladins. Hey, hi, Rez, how about a zoophobia themed battle pass? Back on track. Addison is a shapeshifter, with his animal form being a Fennec Fox. He gets a lot of development in Chapter 5, such as having a relationship with the recent graduate Gustav, and being on bad terms with his ex, Tom. Heh, <laughs> mean the one from Star Versus? No, this one doesn't look like a homestuck OC. There's actually a decent amount of characterization that goes on throughout the chapter. The only issue is that he didn't have any meaningful interaction with Cameron, and probably wouldn't have if the comic continued as it was. All right. Next, of course, is Gustav. Oh, this guy again. Yep. I like him visually. Purple and violet with white is a solid palette. The yellow eyes contrast well with his skin. He is a snake and the visual cues are a bit more subtle than Addy. It's mostly just his fangs and stature that give it away. So I like that little skull that hints at his uh, paleontology hobby that's in the character sheet. Just like Addy, he gets some decent exposure during the fifth chapter. However, I found his uh, reaction to Mackenzie's performance showed a possibly darker side to him. Pity we don't see more of him. All right. This is Rusty. He was just a blonde bully dog who may or may not be gay. Really, only covering this guy because of Autumn. Crazy. Speaking of him, 
Autumn is a lot like Mackenzie, in that he made a very good first impression. He confronted and encountered Frosty and seems to be familiar with the Scrappy Pup. Apparently, he is one of four siblings all themed after every season. Not sure if parents were hippies or just uncreative. Could be both. Moving on to his visual design, his color scheme is very much in line with his name, mainly browns, light yellows, and orange. Of course, he's a deer shapeshifter. This aspect of him is reflected in his hair, which resembles that of a certain... Ooh, 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 pl please, please let me have this. Please. Very well. It's Alistair from Haspen. Pizza time. Which we'll get to later. No! Why? Brutal. Jackie has to be the single most underutilized character next to Cameron. Yet nowhere near as bad because she accomplished her purpose. What purpose would that be, Mr. Keeper? Introducing Cameron to the students, and actually trying to make her feel welcome and comfortable working there. Jackie also isn't a slouch in the visual department either. Her dress is sky blue with yellow accents. Same as her hair, with the exception of the bit of green at the front. Of course, her bright colors reflect her true nature. She's a gigantic bird of paradise. All right. Now, here's Alonzo. Oh, my scales! That face! You look like you're gonna eat her or something? Strike two. Faces are bad. Well, Alonzo isn't the worst design, but he has a few hiccups in the visual department. Yeah, the face is bad. Yeah, that's not all. There's that spotted bow tie that is utterly garish and clashes hard with the rest of the outfit. Make it purple! You still get the quirky look without making it annoyingly quirky. Which is really what this guy comes off as. Unfortunately, this is compounded by the lack of any significant exposure beyond the first chapter. Brutal. Latika has a great color palette in design for a naga. Though, I would have liked some visual hints for her being an art teacher. She doesn't get much exposure, though if Addison's art continued, she probably would have gotten seeing that she adopted them. Blast! Next to Zachariah. Wait a second. Is he a regular cheetah? Yeah, what gives? That was a furry camic. Firstly, yes, he's just a non cheetah who talks. Also, Lion King. Just, just Lion King. Well, now that we got the visual part done, let's talk about him being another underused character. In chapter one, he somewhat explains the setting and serves partially as a guide for Cameron. However, by chapter three, he has shirked this duty, leaving it to Fabian, and she must not be named. That's not ominous at all. Bravo. Speaking of which... Oh no, we're gonna talk about that, are we? Yes, but before we properly tear into the absolute wasteful use of this character, let's at least just cover her visual design. It's utterly unremarkable. As for the misuse, I will give you this here wall of text. Ugh, what a mess. <laughs> to me, massive exposition dumps like this are symptomatic of poor world building. Especially if this is information that the main character and viewer need, need to know in the first chapter. For example, Zachariah should have told us what the school is for, and about the sanctuary. As for the rest of the exposition dump, just bring it up on a need-to-know basis that is digestible for the reader. Another option would just be putting it in supplemental materials that would have your audience jumping from medium to medium, just to make sense of the story, or just tweet a bunch of unneeded trivia, whichever suits ya. Stay on target. Okay, fine. I really wish this character could authentically interact with Cameron, rather than only be used as a crutch to give the audience needed context for the story. I see potential for this librarian, but alas, it's not so. Didn't wait. Uh, not much to say about Keiko and Castifer. Castifer, Christopher, maybe, I don't know. They are the Doctor and Nurse, respectively. Both are crazy in their own ways, overall, 
pretty solid extras. Crazy! Come on! Fabian's a quick one. He's a red fox that constantly hits on camera. Disgusting. Okay, there's a bit of a connection between him and this vampire fox that shows up in chapter three that goes absolutely nowhere. Again, good character that is simply underdeveloped. Bravo! Carrie here is very solid in the visuals department. She's got a very earthy palette suitable for an outdoorsy looking outfit. That said, I have but one gripe with her design. For the longest time, I thought that she was a guy. Really? Look at a picture on the wiki. What, when did this get posted? Why didn't she look like this? Why, Viv? Why do your renders look so much better than the comic? Why? You done? Yeah. So Carrie is one of the few members of the cast to really sit down with Cam and talk with her. Rather than freak her out for whatever reason, given the fact that she's an expert on supernatural beasts, she'd be able to explain certain elements of the setting to Cameron when they crop up. Unfortunately, again, underutilized. Blast! Oh, this guy. Oh, no. Well, you gonna talk about this, Nathan? <laughs> this guy. Okay, now, let's not lose our shells. Nathan here is a reptile guy. He looks the part. Nothing to write home about. He's mainly an extra in this comic. Said so there's a certain sketch I want to show here. <sighs> it's the pasta spider. Pizza time. That's right. Suppose he's going to be a friend of Angel Dust. <laughs> How many has been characters started out here? <laughs> oh no. God help us. Bravo. Major Styx is the butler of the underworld. He looks the part. I just, I just wish his color scheme was more than two primary colors. Not much to say about the character. He mostly plays off the cast of demons in the underworld. You know. His dynamic reminds me a lot of Zazu Mephasa from The Lion King. Yeah, that seems about right. Blast! Hello, Hello nurse. nurse! We have another case of the model sheet looking better than the comic book. Sure, some details are too fine to draw in every, but without some of the accents, she just looks like Jessica Rabbit. It should also be noted that she was a robot designed to corrupt the souls of mortal men. Now. Hence her alternate form for combat being that of a machine. However, she was instead programmed to take care of Damien. As for her relationship with Damien, well, how to put it? Sure, she's not his mother, but she sure is his mommy. Oh, she's definitely been a few guys' as mommy. Please, no. It is a relationship that is very much wholesome and she probably one of the most enjoyable characters. Brutal. All right, Tom's up. I didn't know there was a star for this character from this too. No, this one doesn't look like a homeless type of Egypt. This one looks like an ex Hot Topic poster boy. He's basically Addison's Ibu ex. He's also grouped with the demons because he's actually an incubus. Aside from essentially being an antagonist to Addison, he doesn't get much to do because, again, the comic was cancelled the same chapter he showed up, so that kind of bites. Bravo! So here we have Beast himself. Satan. Or is it Lucifer? So he originally had a more goat-like design in the Son of 666 shorts. Here, the overall form of the goat is kept, but he's a bit more fluid. It's great for making him more expressive. Made for quite the set piece near the end of chapter two. Yeah, he looks more refined here. At least he doesn't look like an apple themed pimp. Pizza time. As for his character, I find him to be very good. He's got the presence befitting his position. Yet ultimately, he is 
concerned for his son's well-being, though the only person who could rein him in to hear out Damien was his wife, who is, of course, next. Or so. Nerissa here is Damien's mother, and most likely the source of his good looks, as he bears more resemblance to her than his father. Worse. Not much to say about Hilda. She's the maid, I think. She certainly has the look down. She's entirely in sepia to highlight just how old-fashioned she is, which basically sums up her character. Bravo. Ah, Casey. I'm of two minds about this character. Wait, who's this again? You don't remember, Casey. You know the lady who got Cameron the job at Zoo High. Well, I don't blame you too much, but we'll get to why a bit later. Firstly, she does have an admittedly good design. Her yellow accents and lightning patterns contrast well against her mostly gray body. I like the apple she has on the desk, good shorthand for being the catalyst for chaos in the series. At least, that's what I would say if it weren't for the one issue exemplified by this one page. Let's get this party started. Four chapters later. Well, we're waiting. Oh, right. That's why I don't remember her. She didn't do anything. Yeah, there was a setup and no follow through, which irritates me to no end because we got three other antagonists that randomly stirred up and were even less notable than Casey here, and chewed up a fourth of a chapter before being utterly irrelevant. In a way, she is a mirror to Cameron, an aspect that seems to be utterly pointless and only muddies the focus of this story as it stands. Come on! Last, but certainly not least, is JJ. Oh, the sparkle pup? It all makes sense now. Oh, come now, it's not so bad. Heck, Viv made a joke one if you want to see something really bad. No, please. Oh, oh no, no, please. No, 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 please. Judging by your reaction, we should get into her visual design first, because there's actually a great deal to talk about when it comes to JJ. Her color scheme is somewhat difficult to discuss. She has many color variations. However, there are two major versions. Her main state is red and blonde, while her more popular design is blue with purple accents. But wait, there's more. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. She has several different color schemes for various occasions. While this normally would push her variant bonus through the roof, there is a singular issue with them. Uh, I think there's a hand too many there. Well, not quite. It is that there are a few inconsistencies between the designs. Sometimes she keeps her hairstyles, sometimes not. In one, she has her overalls. Next, she's wearing a flannel shirt. You'd think she'd keep her signature feather earring, but no, that's not always there. That said, this is a nitpick that justifies me not giving the maximum marks for a variant bonus. That's it, so why am I bothering to bring this point up? Behold, the werewolf posse. Oh, this is a my little pony crap right here. There's, there's more. Don't worry, we won't cover them because this comic never got to the where she's supposed to show up. Then why are we talking about this werewolf? Well... Before we even get to JJ's first appearance, in the Zoophobia Extended Universe, I should clarify that she was originally created by Doll Creep, who gave the rights to Vivian. Since then, some of the ideas from Doll Creep sketches have changed. That said, JJ has only had official appearances in Vivian's music videos, Die Young, and The Most Wonderful Time of the Year. 
the former of which was the introduction for me and many others to zoophobia. To me, JJ embodies Vivian's ability to convey character through action. We see her bombastic and party level personality without her actually uttering a proper line of dialogue. There are a few official concept works on JJ, but as it stands, the rest of her character is kind of up in the air. Should Sophobia be rebooted, I will definitely be looking forward to her appearing once again. Murray! Well, excuse me, princess. Or so. Well, we're through the cast. That only leaves one thing. Can I? Can I? Even if I said no. Pizza time! It's no surprise by now that Hasbin Hotel has its origin in this comic. Alistair being one we already mentioned, had said, What if I told you that the vast majority of the cast came from this very comic? <sighs> Apparently, they were a gang of demons that messed around in the underworld or something. While there are early concepts of Husk, Baggy, Alistair, and some weird looking guy, I want to focus on two specific ones. One of those has to be Angel Dust, right? Of course. Angel Dust actually was a later addition to the cast. In fact, his uh, brother Arrakis predates him, who also wanted to eat Tom. Wait, what now? So without further ado, here are the original concepts for Angel Dust. As you can see, a bit of his base design is mostly intact for has been. If anything, a bit more was added. The only major change was his drag outfit, which was a welcome improvement. Seriously, where was this dress even going? Other than that, he started off as a minor character and now has moved up to being one of the main cast of the show. Now then, I'm giving you two a chance to guess. The other has been character that I'm going to cover. Uh, I, I don't even know a quarter of the cast of that show. No, no, no. I thought she was created just for has been. Truth is often stranger than fiction. Even Charlie has roots here, though this version of her is so different that she might as well be another character altogether. Supposedly, she was going to be something of a motherly figure to the human gang. Again, completely different from has been child, at least as far as we know. Overall, I think Zoophobia is just a very unfocused comic. If it had a decent rewrite, or if it was just restructured in a streamlined manner, I think it could actually be good, but as it stands, it's just kind of a mess. That said, I'll be seeing you all in the next episode of Design Dungeon, which is going to be... Nico, it's Roman! Let's go bowling.